What's going on, Living Fit Show? This is Jesse Grund coming to you live from my headquarters in beautiful Florida. If you were somewhere else that's cold, I apologize. It is beautiful here today. And if you can't tell where Grayson is, it's also beautiful outside today. This is Grayson Strange. He is a 14-year uh, experienced coach. He's been doing this a long time. If you may know him on social media, on IG, he is Strange Grayson. Always doing some things that look really interesting, super challenging, but also emphasizing how his biology works above everything else. Grace, welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm doing well, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course, man. So for some of the viewers who don't know about you, can you tell them a little bit about your journey, about what you do so they can get a better idea of who Grayson is? I totally can. Yeah. Yep. Well, my name is Grayson, as Jesse said. Um, I uh, own a business right now with my wife. We're in upstate New York, which is strange because it's like almost it's going to be 80 degrees today, which is really weird for upstate New York, but <clears throat> at least this early. Uh, we have a training business called Basis New York. We train people out of our house and online combination of like in-person and remote and uh, online programming stuff. And uh, yeah, we've been, we've had this business now officially in New York for two years. And then we owned a gym prior to that in California, doing similar training, but all in person stuff. We have a big emphasis on the FRC, functional range conditioning side of training, and just generally, you know, trying to help people improve their body's abilities so they can go do whatever they want. Um, yeah. And, you know, prior to all the fitness stuff, I had a corporate background trying to climb the corporate ladder and uh, I got really burnt out and depressed about where my work was going. And started coaching at a gym and living in my parents' basement at the same time and sort of starting over. And, and now we're here. That's the 10,000 foot view. It's okay to humble. I've been through that experience where you humble yourself to try and reset what your, where your life journey is going, what that line is, as it's referred to sometimes. And we, we kind of, I think there's this like cultural stigma around like, you know, I went home, I lived at home for a couple of years so that I could do that. But I think that's what home's really for, right? So sometimes we just have to, we got to reset the journey, right? When we're doing something we don't love and maybe we've invested too much time and effort into that. Absolutely, man. Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard. I think there's a lot of pressure on, you know, young people to like, get out, get a job, take care of yourself. But if you have the opportunity to go, I mean, live at home and do something you like, I can tell you in my experience, after having a good corporate job with a salary and retirement and being miserable, moving into my parents' basement and getting paid 20 bucks an hour as a coach was like, it was the best decision I ever made. And I was so much happier, even though I was totally broke and living in my parents' basement as like a 22 year old, you know, but it's all good. Highly recommended. If you have the opportunity, quit that job. If you don't like it, <laughs> we have, we have basements in Florida. They're called swimming pools. So oh, yeah, I bet. But I'll bunch. Um, <laughs> We, we have uh, Grace and I have very similar backgrounds in that I, I came from the corporate world. And I actually think you see that more often than not, where people just kind of have epiphanies, where they discover that either making themselves healthy and then influencing others. What what became kind of that that catalyst for you to make that switch, to make that change? Well, I mean, you know, I I, I started working out in high school because I was really embarrassed about my lack of you know, physical aptitude. I was like not good at sports. I wasn't physically fit in any way. And I was hanging out with these kids who were like all in good shape and could play sports. So I just wanted to, I really did it. It was like ego motivated. It was like, I just need to fit in with these. And I'm such like a skinny little dork. I need to improve myself, you know? So I started training and I loved, I just fell in love with training and I was really consistent and dedicated. And, and I, I stuck with that all the way through high school, college. And then, um, in, into my, my corporate life. And, um, I was, you know, the, I was sort of trying to climb the corporate ladder and spending more time in the office and being around my counterparts who were like, just complained about their job. They didn't have time to work out. They didn't have time to see their kids. And I was literally sitting in the office on like a Friday night at seven o'clock pissed off that I was still answering emails. And I missed my CrossFit class that I was going to go to. And I was like, this is, this is it. Like I'm, I don't know how, how long ago that was. It was in my mid twenties. Like I'm going to be like this. I'm going to be sitting at my computer in the evenings, regretting that I'm sitting here doing this job. I'm just going to quit. What am I going to do? Well, I should do something fitness related. I had a girlfriend at the time who was uh, a coach at a CrossFit gym. And so I, you know, sort of saw that side of the business and had a lot of misconceptions about what it would be like to own a gym as well. Of course, I was like, Oh, you just coach a couple classes in the morning and the evening and you work out, you hang out with your friends, like done. I'm sold. 
little right. did I know that there was far more involved than that, but it was enough to, you know, cash in my 401k, quit my job and beg my parents to let me come move back to Colorado and move into their basement. And nice. Yeah, that was it. Nice. So how did, <laughs> how did you transition from Colorado to New York? Cause that's, that's not like a two minute drive in one direction. It's not a two minute other. drive. No, it's it's quite a long drive. It turns out, actually, after driving the moving truck out here with kids in the oh, car, God. that's that's a whole other story. Um, <laughs> yeah, so that's for I, the I horror hour. That's for the horror that's, hour where we tell the that things for that the you don't hour. want to dream about. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, yeah, I grew I grew up in Denver. Uh, I went to school at Colorado State University, and then right out of I did an internship for the insurance company for Liberty Mutual Insurance. And that was in New York. And so I did six months where I lived in New York before I finished my degree, I worked and then I came back and finished my last semester of school. And they offered me a job. So I moved to New York. And that's where I was trying to climb the corporate ladder. And I ended up going to Dallas to take a promotion there. And that was the last I did that for about a little over a year before I got burnt out and quit. And so after I quit, I moved back to Denver, started this CrossFit gym with my ex girlfriend at the time. And uh, that's a, another another nightmare story for maybe a different nightmare. Hour. <laughs> um, yeah, and so we we coached there. You know, I met my wife at that gym. We eventually left and opened a different CrossFit gym, and we were there until we, you know, we just kind of had a, a falling out with the other partners there. We wanted to go a different direction, so we were trying to decide like if we should start another gym, which sounded like just a, a way too overwhelming of a task. And uh, at the time, Sarah was writing for Rob Wolf's blog doing some nutrition writing and uh, we had done some consulting with them as well. And they it just worked out timing wise where they were looking for two new coaches at their gym in Chico, California, which was called NorCal strength and conditioning used to be NorCal CrossFit, like one of the early mm -hmm. CrossFit affiliates back in the day. And they were like, you know, if you guys want to come out in an interview, you know, maybe, maybe we could work something out. And uh, we went out and did a week long interview there and, you know, fell in love with the people who own the gym were wonderful. And, and so we, packed our stuff up out of my parents' basement and moved to Northern California. We were there at NorCal until for a couple of years, three years, until they sold the gym and somebody else took over that we didn't really want to work for. And so that was when we opened our own gym in California. We had that for about three years and then moved back to New York, which is where my wife is from. So, you know, some coast to coast tours and here we Jeez. are back on the East Coast. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Upstate New York <laughs> at that too, which gets stays really warm all year long. So. Oh man. Yeah. We got soft in California. I'll tell you that as far as the cold right. weather goes this year, I was better prepared, but uh, yeah, now, now I just have to sit outside and soak it up because I've literally been hibernating in the basement gym all winter. <laughs> right. Exactly. It's like, yeah. It's, it's, it, oh, look, it's sun. I got to go experience. What, that what is this? Because... <laughs> I mean, yeah. Last year, I literally like in the nearing the end of the winter, I was having sleeping problems like really bad i was doing it was like taking my vitamin d like I'm going to bed early i'm eliminating i was doing all the things that you're supposed to do and i was sleeping like shit so i was like i wonder if it's just the sunshine it's like it couldn't be like I'm, I'm supplementing with vitamin d can't be that anyway i went to the tanning booth i did six minutes in a tanning bed and i slept for like four nights straight beautifully and so i learned last year that we bought a vitamin d lamp and i go in the winter time i go to the tanning bed once a week for six minutes and like sleep is resolved Nice. Sunshine on my skin, you know. Yeah, so that was a good yeah. learning lesson. I live in Florida. We don't technically. I mean, the coldest it gets here is like I think it got to like twenty something degrees last year, and everybody was like, "It's the end of the world." Like it's not. Well, you're in Central Florida, relatively, yeah, that's pretty damn cold. <laughs> yeah, it is. You know, when you're used to like you know whatever eighty with eighty percent humidity on a regular basis. Um, Dude, so <laughs> it's hard to imagine. So you so there's been kind of a transformation in the way you train, the way you coach, by the way, I'm CrossFit level one certified as well. I got certified back in the day. Um, so nice. I'm curious. So obviously, so if anybody's paid attention to you, where you are as a coach right now and kind of where CrossFit is, I would say, are not necessarily even in the same universes, you know, it's like DC and Marvel. Uh, how did you, how did you get from great analogy? <laughs> how did you, how did you get from one place to the other what occurred that that what was that catalyst that made you go i need to rethink the way i'm thinking about optimizing human biology yeah well i mean it was a couple things like i have always struggled with my ego related to how i should train you know my ego is constantly pushing this more is better thing so crossfit fit right into that little category in my brain it was like 
awesome. If every workout should be a 10, I'm going to do it at an 11. And I was in my 20s and I had low stress for the most part. So I did well. I got strong and the best shape I was ever in. I was really strong, feeling good. Uh, but I slowly started to get burnt out on the intensity thing, even though I was in total denial of it. Like it would crush me and I wouldn't want to work out. And I just would be like, I just got to go hit this workout harder. I know I'll feel better. I mean, it was like junky, like sort of tendencies, but towards exercise. Uh, and, you know, eventually like through my late twenties was when I was getting really burnt out on CrossFit. And that sort of happened right when we went to NorCal strength and conditioning and they had really like backed away from CrossFit. They deal affiliated. They just had a, a different approach. Like we'll get new people in the gym and we won't throw them into CrossFit classes right away. We'll have them do like an on-ramp period where they're learning about basic movement stuff. We're getting some level of movement assessment and we can help them sort of navigate what's appropriate for them to train. And like at that time, even though it seems so obvious now, it was like, whoa, that was a crazy concept that we hadn't thought of. And it sort of just changed my perspective on like, maybe I don't need to like hammer myself into the ground every single day. And then like most people, when they, especially people who've been training hard for a long time, like I hit 30 and my body just started to fall apart. Like all of the training stuff that I was doing was the same, except I was feeling like shit. I literally like my back would go out when I would tie my shoes the wrong way. I mean, like I was strong in the gym and fragile in every other aspect of my life. And, mm. you know, and, and my initial approach was like, well, I'll just stop doing CrossFit and I'll do Olympic weightlifting, which I loved, but it was kind of more of the same for me. Like I'm squatting four days a week and I'm still doing some Metcons, even though they're in my mind, they're backed off on the intensity. And the problems just sort of got worse and worse until you know, I saw some FRC stuff on uh, a friend of mine showed me some FRC stuff on the on Instagram. And I was like, wow, that's they were it was Dewey Dewey doing some really impressive, like hanging shoulder stuff. And I was like, wow, that's crazy. What is this? And I got really intrigued. And we kept you know, we looked at it for like a couple months. And then we finally signed up for the FRC seminar. And that was like the matrix moment of taking the the blue pill, you know, right, like, right. <laughs> mm -hmm. In there, which I think is, is what happens. Yeah, it happens to a lot of people. And I just realized like, wow, everything that I've been doing up to this point was wrong. Not, you know, not in a bad way per se, just due to lack of knowledge. And, it, you know, it, it, I went so far down the rabbit hole that we just sort of were like, when we had the opportunity to open the gym in California, it was like, this is what we're going to do. We're going to open a gym and we're going to have this over, FRC, FRC principles be the overarching theory. And we're going to everything that we do in the gym is going to be related to that. And it was, it was amazing. I mean, for the way my own body felt training, like I didn't think it was possible to resolve all of those issues that I had been having for so long. And then, you know, to, to also see that across a pretty broad population of people that we had been training for a long time. Cause when we left the gym, a lot of people left and came with us over to the gym. So these are people that I'd been training for years before that. And I was well aware of all their problems. And within a few months of them doing like kin stretch classes and having FRC mixed in with the strength training, they were like, dude, my shoulder's fine. I can do pull-ups again. Like my back stopped hurting. All these people were just starting to feel better. And we we're like, okay, cool. Like this is the right path. And you know, I've just been riding that, that, that wave down the rabbit hole deeper and deeper for the last, oh, well, we went in 2016. So it's been like six years, a little over of FRC stuff. So yeah, that's how I got there. It was 20, 2018 for me where I had the same epiphany where I went to, I actually had a company pay, pay me for it. I was writing. Oh. Uh, I was, yeah, yeah, exactly. So I actually wrote, um, I wrote a curriculum for a nonprofit called Boulder Crest, uh, where I wrote 18 months of wellness curriculum for the company. And they work with uh, first responders and um, combat veterans with PTSD, except they, they teach post-traumatic growth instead of just like there's, it's so, the, so there's a whole element of health and wellness to it. And so they employed me to write basically the entire wellness curriculum. So I wrote 18 months of curriculum that like 5,000 people a year go through right now, which is really cool. That's but part cool. of what part of the agreement was, I was like, Hey, I really want to go to this FRC course. Part of your payment towards me can be to pay for that. And they were like, cool, we'll do that. And so I went to so FRC course in 2018 and tried to lift my toes and pretty much bought in right at that moment. <laughs> so <laughs> That big toe lift off man that hooks people in. <laughs> uh, I have Moses walks uh, Moses, Dr. Moses Bernard, uh, who we'll hopefully have on the show soon, walked over to me and he goes, why are you finger gunning your big toes? And I looked down at my fingers. I was like pointing at my fingers while I was doing it. I had no idea why. And it just kind of, it just clicked in my head. But then as like you kind of said, you know, I interviewed Gray Cook 
as part of the wellness curriculum. And I love Gray. Gray, Gray and Dr. Sveen actually speak a lot of the same language. There's just a little bit of difference in the evolutionary process for how we get to where we are. Right. And he said the main thing that he sees wrong in the training community, which I think you'll appreciate, is the fact that nobody listens to the Hippocratic Oath. You think because you aren't a PT or a doctor that the Hippocratic Oath doesn't apply to you. But when in actuality, right. as a coach, it should be the very first thing you are thinking about, which is do no harm. And that should be the underlying way I think about training another human being. That should totally. be step one. And he said, that's that's where I see when I did the interview with him, he goes, and it was, and that kind of went off in my head where I was like, ooh, I didn't even think about that. Like, is what I'm doing potentially causing harm? Because if it is, then I need to stop doing it. And so I think FRC kind of lends itself. And I love the inclusive, the inclusion portion of it. And that kind of seg me in, segue me into your next question. Most people think, oh, you train FRC. It's like, that's the thing you do. And it's like, no, it's to actually be able to be able to do other things. Like that's kind of the idea. So now I've seen, and most of us have seen some crazy feats of strength by you, Thanks, bent man. presses, Kelly snatches. How did you suddenly get into like this old timey strong man side of your training that we're starting to see now, which made you a bit Insta famous because people are like, I got to follow this guy. There's some it's weird, crazy. but amazing <laughs> stuff going on here. <laughs> yeah. But how did, how did, how did you kind of transition into that being, you know, a big part of your, I'm not saying your only part of your training, but a big part of your training now when it comes to expressions of force by you. Yeah. Well, I, at the gym in California, I had, I met some friends there who did like, you know, current competitive strongman training, like the stuff you see on TV. And I was really, it was really appealing, keeping in mind the FRC stuff where it's like, wow, those are like, those are ranges of motion that are quite demanding, but also things that I had been very scared of in the past, like picking up an Atlas stone and seeing but somebody in a huge amount of spine flexion that's loaded to a high degree and they're picking something up off the ground. I was like, Oh, that's crazy. I want to do that. And then thinking about how, you know, through the lens of FRC, how you could approach your training to make your body capable of doing that. That was really appealing mostly just because those were all positions that I had been hurt in. So that got me down the, the rabbit hole of strongman training. Um, and the the old time stuff i slowly started to see more of that as i was just you know out on the internet looking at books and stuff about that golden era of training and again it was more like i can't i can't possibly do that like i remember the first time i tried to do a bent press like trying to make my body get into that shape with no weight in my hand and i was like i i can't hold, why can't i keep my arm vertical like i can't even get my body in that position it was really motivating to try to train that and and so like the thing that I find the most appealing about the old time strongman stuff is the, is just the fact that it's a, it's, it's demanding on all of the levels of what we want from our body. Like you have to have a lot of strength, but you have to have a lot of mobility and control of those positions. And that aspect is appealing because it's so much broader than what the normal training is. And like the way that those guys approach training was really cool. Like they had a really holistic approach. You know, they did a couple days of strength training, but they weren't trying to train six days a week. They went outside. They, you know, wanted to go out in nature and hike and do cardio and like do stretching and all of this stuff that really kind of fits into the, the mindset of FRC where like we need all of these qualities. And they were sort of on that page without, I mean, without knowing that there was a system for it or anything like that. And that that's that's really appealing. And just the fact that like, it was so damn hard for me to do that stuff. Like it felt so far away that it was really, I was motivated to try to push to develop that. And then the FRC training was what really allowed me to make that sustainable. Yeah. Every time I see you Kelly snatch, there's a little part of me that dies. So it's just, <laughs> even when just I like, watch the video, I want my shoulder like, to do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <laughs> totally. I mean, the first time, I mean, the first time I saw a Kelly snatch, I was like, that's ridiculous. Like, why would anybody want to do that? And I was like, let me try it. And then I mean, trying to do it with the 45 pound barbell was like impossible. I couldn't even just coordinate the movement to get my arms up. It made no sense at all. And that was motivating. And so I kept pursuing. I was like, oh, this is cool. Like there's so much spine flexion and the timing and the, the shoulder extension, like all of those components are just, they're sweet. Like I like, I look at those old time movements as something that it's not, it's not a good assessment to tell you like what your shoulder joint can do, but if somebody can comfortably do a bent press or a Kelly snatch, like your parts are in pretty good shape because those movements right. are impossible to do without those qualities. 
Yeah, there's a guy named Gary Gray who says he's a PT. He says the test is the exercise and the exercise is the test. He goes, they, they, you can look at them, the, the lens can be both, you know, and yeah. you can look at, you look at the way somebody does something like that and you go, huh, yeah, you can do some stuff. There's some stuff yeah. there for you to be able to work with, as we refer to in FRC. Dr. Spina just likes to talk about stuff, your stuff. And I tried totally. to, <laughs> my clients are like, what stuff? What are you talking about? I was like, just the stuff. Um, stuff. It is stuff. <laughs> Speaking speaking of the speaking of the spine, which uh, we're, I'm really excited to eventually talk to Dr. Bernard because we're going to do a whole episode on spine, but I do want to talk to you about yeah. it. I think there's obviously this stigma that's associated with spine flexion, where we have all of these people out there, insta famous PTs, insta famous trainers who are just neutral spine this, neutral spine that. But then when you see things like you know zercher pickups by the soviet union from back in the day which they used to do to strengthen their body or you know the atlas stone pickups that you see and you see these guys going into these degrees of spine flexion to then be able to express these large amounts of strength you talk a little bit about how your spine training's kind of evolved as you've kind of learned how the spine works and why spine flexion shouldn't be necessarily this taboo topic that we avoid yeah i would love to yeah i mean i I mean, I totally understand why there's such a stigma about it because I was that person who hurt their back and spine flexion more times than I could possibly count. So I used to coach the same thing. I mean, many of the things that I used to coach people on was bad advice and I just didn't know any better. And my goal was to keep them safe. And so it's like, well, if you hurt your back when it rounds and that feels bad, we'll just avoid it. Just train that neutral spine. And, you know, for me, I always had the, the, the question in my head, like I'm training in my neutral spine all the time. Why does my back I would have back spasms with my spine in a neutral position. If I lifted heavy, I was like, this doesn't make any sense. Like there's something missing and I don't know what it is. Maybe my back just sucks. You know, for a while I went through that period of just being depressed that I just, I have this bad spine. Everybody else's spine is probably fine, but I was have this bestowed upon me, this terrible spine. Um, and you know, FRC of course changed my perspective to some degree. It's like, all of these qualities of movement that your body has are trainable qualities. And that was something I was like, Oh, well, I guess that makes sense. Like your spine does bend, it extends, it twists, it rotates. Maybe I should start training that. And, and just from the assessment component, when I tried to do spine segmentation, it was like, oh yeah, I, I literally can't move my spine. Like no wonder it doesn't feel good if I round it a little bit when I'm bending it over, especially since there's load there. And coupling that with looking at like my hips, like I had no hip internal rotation on my right hip and I was having constant back spasms on my right side, which was a huge contributor to that. Training those things and having like debilitating back pain for like three years. And then in about a year of training, having my back pain go away and doing all these things that I couldn't do. I was like, oh, all right, obviously this stuff is good. We need to train these things. And now, you know, I mean, I, I still, because I had so much I had so many times where I threw my back out and I was, couldn't do anything like, you know, wife is dressing me because I can't bend over to put my clothes on. Um, I still have that deep rooted fear sometimes. And so I, sometimes I'm like, I'm going to do this thing today when spine flexion. And I still have this little fear in the back of my head, but it's so nice to just have the, to see where my back was and see what I can do with my back now. And just to have the freedom to do that. And it's so inspiring to do that with other people, like have them start training spine flexion and have it feel really good. And they're like, my back doesn't hurt anymore when I bend over. I mean, that stuff is like, you know, it's the best part of the job, honestly. So you've learned obviously how to segment your spine. Are you working with anything right now that kind of helps you learn how to segment just a little bit more? Cause just, this is a new, this is a new world that we're getting into like, Oh, Hey, I've got trainable elements on my spine that I need to train. So yeah. are you working with anything right now to help with that? Yeah, actually, uh, I'm working with this company called BackSync, and they have a new product called the SegB, which is basically a tool for giving you feedback on how your spine moves. It's like piano keys on a board almost that you lay on, and when you move a section of your spine, you have in an individual key that clicks up and down, so you can feel it, you can hear it, there's a line on the side, so you can visually see these keys moving up and down, or wow. if you're like coaching them and watching it, uh, and it's I mean, I saw it like when it was in the early stages of being made and I was like, I messaged the guy. I was like, dude, this is, this is amazing. When is this out? I need to use this thing because as, as I mean, as you know, introducing somebody to how their spine moves is tricky. I mean, a lot of the stuff is tricky because since how your joints move are pretty much involved with your brain's understanding of where they are in space. If you don't have a lot of movement there, it's really hard to tell what the hell you're doing. And so right. having this thing that gives you a ton of feedback is it's like the, it's the easiest thing I've found to help somebody understand how to do spine segmentation. 
Mm. So yeah, yeah, that's yeah, and they just came out. They're actually available right now for presale. Holy, if you, you want to get your hands on one? Yeah. Whoa! I wonder if I can yeah. if I if I can test one out for them. Anyway, um, I wish you were closer. <laughs> I would just bring it over to you. It's it's a little. Just come to our. Just come to Disney World, and then we'll we'll take care of it. Just come to Disney ah, World, dude. I'm like, down. Start, I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> yeah, just come come to Disney World. It's fine. Um, so uh, so spine training, joint training, it's kind of evolved you into this thing where you've become kind of famous in social media for some of the stuff you've done. Have you seen this influx? Because I feel like one of the big things that I've talked to other coaches about is the medium virtually of biomechanics is difficult because you're you're kind of watching in a 2D plane how a 3D body moves. So as yeah. as you've kind of grown and your online uh, client base has grown, can you talk a little bit about how you kind of overcome this 2D medium to actually get and understand how somebody's moving and actually get them to a place where you can really assess and properly train their biology, even in this medium? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's definitely been a, a learning hurdle to, to do this stuff mostly online. I would probably say like 90% of our business is over the phone. And so, and all of my experience prior to like, we started doing online stuff about uh, just before COVID started. So well, it's been like three years now that we've been doing a lot of online stuff. And in the beginning, it was really challenging to get somebody to understand what I wanted them to do because I was so used to just going in and putting my hands on them and, you know, giving them some tactile feedback. Um, now that's just evolved into a much more involved discussion about what they're feeling it, you know, discussing like the sensations that I'm looking for and where they should be in their body and what it feels like when they're actively doing it. What does it feel like when they stop doing it? Like just, there's a, a much deeper level of talking about it that needs to happen. Um, but at, at this point now it's, it's interesting. Like it was something that in the beginning I didn't think would ever work as well as doing it in person. And with the amount of time we've had doing it now, it's, I feel just as comfortable and the success rates are just as high doing it this way. There's just, there's a lot more talking about it and, you know, helping people understand like, this is where I need you to set your phone up, trying to get them far enough back so I can see what they're doing. I mean, there's a lot of right. those little details, especially for people who aren't used to doing stuff over the phone. Um, but it, uh, it, it works really well and I really enjoy it. Although, uh, it's, it's funny cause I've also just had this mental shift of like, this is depressing to only do this over the phone with people. Like I like this in contact thing and I still really do like the in-person training, but the online side has just opened up to, you know, the, the potential to meeting people that I would never know about people all over the world that I've gotten to train and meet. And that, that aspect has been really wonderful. Like it's, I'm, I'm grateful for the technology, despite all of the negative stuff, like what happens when your Instagram account grows, you just, you get new people in there that are great to train, but you also get an influx of a lot of other people who think that you're an idiot and you're just, you know, you're bastardizing exercise or whatever. I mean, there's all of the bad right. side of it, which is, you can't have, can't separate those things. I know, but um, yeah, it's been, it's been interesting to say the least. Yeah. It's, I'd say it's interesting about social media. Like you and I met through social media, obviously both being FRC coaches, both deep down the FRC rabbit hole. I think we've yeah. both done pretty much every course that they, they offered and could do. Um, there are some positives to social media because you and I would never connect it otherwise, exactly. um, you know? Um, so, so there are some positives to it, but you kind of have to weigh through the positives and the negatives as you're doing this and understand there's going to be some positive human contact that you're going to make. And then there's also going to be just grime and sludge and people who don't want to, <laughs> they don't want to have discussions. They just want to tell you their opinion. And, yeah. and I think that's the toughest part about our industry right now is that there's so many opinionated people who aren't educated. And then there's so many educated people who just have given up on educating because there's so many opinionated people just shouting at them, their opinions. And I think it's this terrible thing right now where it's just like somebody like you or me are just like, Hey, I'm just going to, I'm going to tell you about it. And hopefully that you respond to it. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so. totally. I mean, there's so many, there's so many tactics that you can use to get attention and I, I'm totally guilty of doing that stuff. You know, like if I make a post doing some crazy Zercher deadlift from the floor shirtless and the good lighting, you know, like that's a good post because it gets a lot of attention but it's not the most educational. I mean, you know, my hope is like, if I, I want to show people the, maybe what is perceived as crazy stuff and then try to elaborate more through other posts on how I would approach that as opposed to just doing it. But like, 
you got to get those people in there to be able to show them that. And the, the most terrible part is that if you just make a really good informational post, half the time it gets so little attention just because of how the right. algorithm works. It's like, I know so many people who put out wonderful information and it's like, damn it, why aren't there more likes on this video? Like this should have 10,000 likes. This is a really helpful thing, but you know, seeing a jacked CrossFitter doing an impressive workout is always going to be more impressive and get more attention. So it's definitely like, it's, it's a grind. I mean, I find a lot of the time I just don't have enough bandwidth to keep up with Instagram, like being on there all the time, you know, it's kind of part of the, the game. And that is something that I, I suck at and I get burnt out on it. I go through these ways where like, I hate Instagram. I'm never posting again. And then I'm, then I guilt myself into doing it. And you know, it's, it's tough. It's definitely, it's tough. Although I really like the business now, you know, like coming from having mostly having a, a physical business that we had to go to and train people at having the flexibility now to do it all from home. Like I really like that a lot, but there is a much heavier demand on the social media side now, because otherwise I'm just a dude in a basement. And how is anybody going to know that unless I have these social media stuff, you know? So just make sure, just make sure your adorable daughters in some of the videos and that you're, you're, you know, shirtless and you'll be fine. You'll be fine. Absolutely. That's it. You'll be fine. That's the you'll recipe. Sadly. It's, it's <laughs> terrible. Like my videos, it's like, it's like, hey, uh, why did that one get so many views? Oh, I had a professional wrestler in it. What about the educational one? Six views. Oh, okay, I got it. Thank you. All right, I understand know. you, Instagram. Thank you so much. Um, well, hey, if somebody wanted to train with you, if somebody was looking into trying to optimize themselves from an FRC standpoint, and they didn't want to do it with me, they wanted somebody with more facial hair. How in, <laughs> exactly? <laughs> Sometimes, man, it's like it's like the wrong. That's all it Swanson takes is effect. a beard, a braid, and a beard. You know, effect. a braid and a beard, right? Yeah. Uh, how would somebody reach out to you? How would somebody be able to find you to be able to do that? Oh, well, there's a few ways. Uh, you know, probably contacting me through my Instagram is the easiest way. I have a contact form in my link tree. The name of our business is Basis Health and Performance New York. You can go check out our website. It's it's basishpny.com. Uh, it's funny. I have to remember what the website's called because I never look at it. Um, yeah, contact me through there. You can send me a DM. Check out our programming on Train Heroic. You know, I always... I'm happy to answer questions. We have a free cars routine video on YouTube too. I always try to tell Ooh. people like, if I don't ever see you again, or you don't want to train with me at all, please just go get that cars video and do your cars till the day you die. And you will do quite a lot. So I know you feel the same way about that. Mm -hmm. Yes. But yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, Grayson, thank you for being on the show. We really appreciate pleasure, all your man. information. Thank you happy. for continuing to share the stuff that you share. Please don't let, don't let it burn you out, you know, keep oh, being thanks, you. Man. I think you being authentic, you being you is such a benefit to those of us who, who follow you. So I appreciate your time. I really today. appreciate that. Thanks, man. Likewise, I feel honored to be here. Thank you.